How do you deal with data at end of life? Holding on to data too long can be very costly and increase risk. So how do you get rid of it safely? You're listening to Defense in Depth. Welcome to Defense in Depth. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. And I am joined with a guest co-host, Sean Bowen, CISO for Restaurant Brands International, also known as RBI. Sean, thank you for joining me as a guest co-host. You've been a frequent guest. Being that you're such an awesome guest, I thought you'd be a great guest co-host. So thank you. Thank you. Look at it. Oh, well, I'm hoping you're more verbose than that. Uh, Stay right. t- <laughs> I could do it. I didn't know how much you want to go. You didn't mention that part. Hold tight in just a second. I'm going to mention our sponsor. IT Asset Management Group. They're also responsible for bringing our guests today. And you'll see why, because our topic really has everything to do with what they do. But I want to talk about essentially why this is a big issue. And I was kind of surprised we don't, we've never talked about getting rid of data, which kind of astonished. And two plus years of doing shows, all our podcasts, we've yet to really approach this topic. And I realized that Consuming too much data is like overeating. It's super easy and cheap to overeat. It's super cheap and easy to collect a lot of data. But wow, it is costly dealing with obesity and too much data. I mean, I got to assume you've seen this problem play itself out, Sean. Yeah, absolutely. I actually had a a meeting today discussing this very problem. Everyone's looking for a regulatory requirement that says how long you can keep it. And that doesn't exist. There are always minimums, never maximums. And so people just keep the data for way too long. I got to imagine, though, aren't there some industries that do have a regulation about getting rid of data at a certain time or no? Not that I've come across so far. Uh, Well, you know, maybe our guest might know some of these because he's dealt with, I'm sure, many, many other industries. Our sponsored guest today is the partner with IT Asset Management Group. It is Frank Milia. Frank, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. What's the motivation to fix this problem? Bradley Cheatham, Access Interactive, said, quote, data is a toxic asset. He was quoting Bruce Schneier there. Get rid of it sooner rather than later. The risk of holding on to it far outweighs the value of keeping it. And Faiz AS of Digital Soft Lab says, don't overdose with data because managing Maintenance and controls comes with costs, penalties, and implications. Unless compliance mandates the retention, recovery the preservation will always be based upon many such factors. And a couple of last quotes here. One from Aaron Bishop of Eigenspace said, quote, data, the more you keep, the more risk you inherit. I like that one. And Patrick Garrity of Blumira said, quote, define your retention policy and adhere to it. A nice, simple quote that's got a lot of complications attached to it. Yes, Sean, I'm like, yeah, let's have a retention policy and adhere to it. Not so easy, is it? No, not at all. And I think that your opening was spot on with the fact that we've gone a couple of years and I haven't talked about this because that is a perfect microcosm of how we actually treat it in the industry. We just don't think about it. It's so cheap and we just collect it and collect it and collect it. And I had two stickers on my desk my last job. One was data is the new bacon. And data is gold. And I think we've all kind of heard that type of phrase. And what's the first thing we do when we see bacon or gold? We hoard it all. And and that's kind of the same attitude we're doing with data right now is if you ask the marketing team or the analytics teams, the business development teams, the first question they answer when you ask them, how long do you want to keep this data is forever. And that's the very first answer they always say. And then you have to work them back from there. And so That is definitely the norm in the industry of data right now. So, Frank, you're essentially joining us in a discussion that we should have had a long time ago. This is just like, you know, like the thing you know you should do, but you don't think about doing. And how do you get people to start thinking about this that may not be thinking about it and and literally have that answer of, oh, let's just keep it forever. You look at this and the problem with retaining all of this data, if it's not serving a purpose to the business and you're not able to monetize it and you have no regulatory or legal requirement to be holding it, you're just holding liability. So if you look at fixed assets, for instance, that are in your data center cages or in uh, conference rooms around your offices, how do you protect 
those points of intrusion that are possible there. As those assets are sitting around, they're more likely to be accessed by unauthorized people. They can be stolen. They can be lost. There's so many reasons to rid yourselves of data that you're not able to, again, serve the business in any way. The faster you act, the better to rid yourself of that liability. And I got to imagine that security, Sean and, and Frank, back me up on this, security drops to zero when you're dealing with really old physical assets. I can imagine like computers that people have in their closet for which they have not wiped hard drives or they haven't pulled the hard drives out of. I can't imagine there's any security on those things. No, and, and you gotta think, the only, well, the only security is really obsolete technology. There's not too many five and a quarter drives running around right now. Yeah. <laughs> so you have that technology advantage from that perspective. But Frank brought up a good point of whether or not it's hard assets or cloud assets, because we're just talking about data generically. And when we start talking about data in the cloud versus data on-prem, the way you handle that and the way you're responsible for that is vastly different for that, that disposition component of it, whether you degauss your hard drives, destroy them, pulverize them, or do you just do like a rewrite and delete your cloud instance? And so how you have that plan is depending on how your environment is, and then you have to keep up with your environment as well. Yeah, I, Frank, I posted about this on LinkedIn. We had a nice discussion going. There was a lot of like, have a plan, adhere to it, kind of like what Patrick said. Then when I read more and more of it, and I talked with you, this is a really complex issue that just keeps mushrooming and mushrooming and mushrooming. Yeah, at the core of it, it's it's really a people problem because you have to have a process for, for dealing with your end-of-life assets. And then you have to have the training in place and the people being held accountable to do it and all the records management around that to prove that you've done it. So whether it's for compliance or security, it's a very difficult thing to accomplish because you need to give people the tools to be able to do it and then oversee it which is never an easy thing to do in any business operation. Where do we begin? Jonathan Waldrop of Insight Global said, quote, the business unit owns the data and makes decisions about the data lifecycle, creation, retention, disposition, understanding legal and regulatory requirements on your data, financial, tax, employment, contracts, et cetera, is also critical to determine when you can destroy the data and Frank, I'm going to ask the, the question I had for Sean at the beginning of the show of, does anyone say at certain time, get rid of it? Because you've dealt with lots of industries. And Neil Saltman of Anomaly said, quote, most companies don't have a handle on all their assets. So limiting data is really the best way to limit exposure. Travis Howard of Accenture Federal Services said, quote, I would further caution that client data is an even more toxic byproduct that must be carefully accounted for. And lastly, Matthew Warner of Blumira said, quote, end of life of data needs to live with the classification of that data, and it needs to be automatically reaped whenever possible. So there was talk about automatic removal and the client data and the issue of, you know, regulatory issues. So let me start with that first question I've had. Are there any industries that say, after X period of time, you got to get rid of it. So I'm not aware of any industries that say you need to dispose of data, but all the regulatory compliances around data disposition all have the same principle. They're all based on the reasonable principle that you take reasonable action to protect unauthorized access to data, to protect the data. So could one argue that it is unreasonable to hold data for decades and decades without a plan in place? for disposing of it. Because as I mentioned earlier, the that time that you're holding that end of life data is just creating more and more points for potential exposure. So um, I, I would argue that having that data for longer than is necessary is really an unreasonable practice. Good point. Sean, do you treat client data any differently than you treat your own data? Short answer, no, uh, but that's also the business I'm in is a little bit different. And even my past business in the government didn't really have to deal with client data. But on the other end, being the client, yes, I would have that standard on the uh, vendors or whoever was holding my data to that they better protect it a lot more. And, and uh, as I read that comment, I thought through the fact that that's probably not often tagged or it's just tagged generically client data done. It doesn't say what type of client data, you know, so it's not it kind of probably just goes into a bucket much too big. But I appreciate Frank's comment of keeping data longer than you need it. That gets back to that whole problem that we face earlier. And, and Jonathan Waldrop's comment is, is utopia. 
of the business owns it and the business makes all these decisions. That's the ideal state. If we can have a business leader who can actually make all of the decisions and understand the decision they're making, that would be golden. But unfortunately, that's not always the case. There's a lot of, well, I don't know, and I want to keep it for this long. And then you get into, as, as Frank mentioned, what's the, how long do you keep data for two decades or whatever? Well, if it's transactional data with a customer and you want to show their lifelong business with you, you want to keep that data for a certain amount of time and show that they've been a customer for 20 years and how much money they've invested in your company, et cetera. And so it becomes this kind of awkward dance of what do we need to keep for that long? And then there's the whole, what happens when you have a single document or a single file that's got multiple types of data on it, like PII and transactional data, but I only need the transactional data for three years, but I need to get rid of the PII. You know, how do you start to shred out individual documents? It's not like you print it up and cut it in half and then shred one half and then save the other half. So it just becomes that complexity starts to get even more crazy. So, uh, let me throw that. That's actually a really good point. So Frank, have you dealt with that specific scenario that Sean just put out? Um, no, you know, the, the classifications don't generally make it to me, you know, so by the time I'm involved, we are limitlessly destroying everything. Going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and our agreements specifically say, you know, if you hand it to us, it's gone forever, right? Which is another business risk to think about. So you had all this data that you had to fight with leadership to dispose of in the first place. And now it's officially no return. And the comments I saw online were largely don't give it to people like Frank, do it in house. So you got to find that balance. So I heard an interesting comment about that is it is a split kind of a thing. Like there's a point where the size of the company grows, where you really need an organization like Frank's to deal with it. And when you're really small, it's usually tasked to the IT department, not security. Correct me if I'm wrong there, Sean. It's usually IT's department to get rid of it. Well, often security is often pawned off to the IT department too when you're really small. But yes, yeah. No, but it it there comes to a point where it's like, this is not something we can and should be handling. We would need an organization to dispose of this. But the other issue, and we'll get to this, is you know, hey, uh, I also need verification that they're doing this, what they're saying. So Frank, let me ask you, what are the size of companies that come to you and do mom and pop come to you or not at all? It does happen. The problem with mom and pops is they usually don't have a budget for this sort of thing. So they go with the easiest route and the, and the cheapest route. But, you know, I would argue it's very important that no matter what size a company gets, that they do have internal processes before the handoff to a firm like ours. So whether that be encryption before handoff or they're erasing the machines themselves and then having the, the lease return or, or the equipment go out to the disposal vendor, there's certainly all types of on-site treading and, and the gousing options and things like that, that that relieve the customer from those requirements. But every organization really needs our services in some way, no matter how big or small, because eventually they still need to have that handoff in the end. What aspects haven't been considered? Aaron Bishop of Eigenspace said, quote, Endpoints, virtual instances, backups, cloud surfaces, and supply chains are all areas where these policies and procedures of the organization might be misconstrued, can't be met, or has a lack of documentation. And Jason Dance of Greenwich Associates said, quote, I posit that the ever-increasing amount of data flowing through our inbox, file server, Slack channel, favorite SaaS provider tool is increasing the need to react quickly and decreases our ability to consider the life cycle of the data. So this gets to what you discussed, Sean, that there are a lot of essentially other points that are not, that are data that is not sitting on a physical server in-house, as we know of the, all these cloud instances. You have to deal with your own data going out. I guess, how do you deal with it, you know, I guess with contracts or with your others and how do you get verification? I mean, what do you do? We generally, for the generic user, we have a 90-day uh, retention for most data, you know, inboxes and things like that are all, we just del automatically delete after 90 days. And then you have to actively choose that you want to retain something for longer. So like for, as you point out, vendors, I have a separate vendor folder that I keep all my vendor communications in that has a longer retention because I need to refer back to something that we discussed last year or whatever that may be. So we have that delete by default. And then, which I think is a good approach for the most part, 
the trick around it, obviously, some users have figured out is just set up a uh, forward or auto rule to push it to another folder. And so we have to kind of figure out that balance of the education of the user still, not just, you know, do, trying to do things through technology. And Frank, I got to assume that when you're talking with the client, half of the discussion is, you know, okay, you know, we're getting taking this, but have you considered this? Have you considered this? Have you considered this? I got to assume there's a lot of Oh, crap. Yeah, that. Oh, wait. No, yeah, that. Yeah. So the responsibility for protecting the access to protected data is disproportionately the data controllers. So you can go out and hire a vendor to perform these services, but but there actually is no legal way to transfer that liability. You can sue them for not adhering to their contract and agreement that they perform poorly and it leads to a breach. But so much of the legwork is really done at the organization that that is the data controller in order to set this up correctly. And for instance, for you know GDPR, you have this more strict prescriptive means for having to protect your, your data, your client data, including contractual agreements if you send that data offsite to a partner. So there's so many things that weave into this subject, certainly. How do we handle this? Joseph So, CISO for Scotiabank, said, quote, when disposing the data physically, such as hard drive, not only is degaussing important, but having it certified that it is crushed is important as well. You want absolute certainty that the data can't be recovered. So I know I had chatted with you earlier, Frank, about the need for verification. What are the different levels of verification? And you were saying about transfer liability. If you verify that you destroyed something and they can trace back that maybe you didn't, aren't you liable at this point or no? Yes, right. But it depends on the quality of that verification and the quality of the the service that's being provided. And by that, I mean, so what do we mean by certified in, in this quote? Many times an organization says, I have 200 hard drives. The vendor comes, scans the serial numbers, gives that back to the, the organization, says, I certify that I did this. Is that really a reasonable amount of proof that they've handed you an inventory back? There was no reconciliation done. There was no witness of it being performed. So these things really matter when it comes down to having to answer to a regulator or, you know, looking at did this event actually happen or not? But but hold on, wait, have you been brought into cases, the legal cases where it's like, hey, you know, we got verification that IT asset management group did destroy our stuff and you had to produce documents to prove that that was? We've never been a part of a legal proceeding to, to my uh, knowledge, but we have many times been asked to provide our data back to our customers to prove that we have had hands on an asset and performed the data destruction on it. And that's why I think tools are, are very important to be discussed at length, especially when it comes to verification, because uh, data erasure to me is, is one of the better tools to have in your tool belt because of the verification aspect of it. The leading enterprise software erasure tools will provide a certificate to the NIST 888 standards of when it was done, verification that it was performed, whereas crushing or degaussing of a drive, you're asking for a human to certify that that event happened. So unless that's witnessed, I do think that erasure is an important key of, uh, you you can erase and then shred, you can do all types of things. And I do worry that sometimes people focus too much on tools and not enough on on process and documentation and vetting their vendors out. You know, in the recent news, actually, you know, this uh, app Parler, Sean, where individuals who were involved in the in the uh, the riot on the Capitol, when they realized, oh, they're coming after me, they went and they deleted their old messages off of Parler, only to find out that someone had scraped all the previous messages from Parler, even the deleted ones. And this is a good example of why deleting is not the same thing as erasing. And do you have to deal with like sort of explaining that to your users? Yeah, so not so much where I'm currently at. I did work in the intelligence agencies and we had a very robust destruction process. Uh, You know, NSA's rules for classified hard drives is shredded or destroyed to smaller than two millimeters of pieces or incinerated. So back to that physical part that Frank's talking about, how do you, is someone actually going out there and measuring these pieces And then do you do that for all of your hard drives? Do you do that for everything? Because as soon as you start talking to the finance officer, 
they're going to want to repurpose things and see where they can reuse things. And so you get into the point of where you have to get going back to where do you begin is at that beginning of data tagging. So the finance department hard drives will be set for erasure and destruction at X, but you might allow marketing to be set at erasure and reuse or something to that effect. And so you have to balance that. But now you have this maze of mapping who got this hard drive when it went back to the IT help and a new employee came and you give it back out. You're tracking that hard drive throughout your company. And in the industry I was previously in, in the government, that was common. We had every single hard drive, the serial number of the hard drive was logged. We knew what device it was in, who it was used for. And if an incident happened where unauthorized data ended up on that device, we logged it as the higher classification so that we knew when we needed to destroy it, it had to be destroyed to that specification. And so to your company, you're not going to want to destroy all of your data or all of your hard drives, all your hardware to the same level, depending on what kind of company you're in. And so you have to balance that out based off of the uses of it. But that begins a whole nother nightmare of um, managing your inventory. One last question I want to ask, because it came up in a conversation I wanted to have about donating equipment. One person said that if there was ever critical information on it, it can never be donated. Is that the case? And the, kind of, you kind of referred to that when you were saying like something has to be tagged if it had an incident on it or something. Are there, I guess, hard drives you classify, this can be donated, this can't be donated no matter what? Or can you completely erase a hard drive no matter what one it is and it could be donated? You know, should it be like an end of life hard drive? Yeah, so I think it depends on your level of skepticism or tinfoil hat approach to things, right? Because well, you did work for the government. I, yeah, I did. So in my <laughs> old world, nothing could be donated. You had to destroy everything. Because when you start to think about the fact that we were able to recover the burnt hard drive from the shuttle that crashed uh, you know, 15 years ago, where we were able to recover data off of that. If we're recovering data off of hard drives that crashed through the atmosphere, like that's the, we're recovering data from just about anything. But what is the likeliness of that? And what is the value of that data that someone has to go through that level of effort to gain from it? So you kind of balance that out. And you hear every year or two, someone's financial data got donated and they didn't even wipe it. And so that gets back to Frank's comment of the process. It wasn't that the donating was broken. It was the erasure and degaussing or whatever you need to do to prep it for donation that failed in that situation. Frank, I wanted your last comment on this donation thing. Do you actually do that? Do you actually, are there hard drives that come in with sort of different destruction classifications? And can you just wipe drives by like NIST standards and then actually donate? Or how does that work? Yeah, so we've actually facilitated over 10,000 donations of uh, PCs and laptops throughout the history of the business. And it mostly comes from erasing the hard drives from from customers, like Sean was saying, that have different risk tolerance levels on this. In my personal opinion, I don't believe there's a lot of risk at all to performing a NIST 888 purge erasure on a drive and reusing it. But we're also not dealing with issues of national security. So the NSA requirements that we could actually help customers meet, I don't generally suggest to a, a, an ad agency or even a finance company. So, I mean, the two millimeter shredding that Sean mentioned earlier is starting to become a bit of a trend and security. And when you look at what happens when we physically shred drives on site to, let's say, seven millimeters, it's then mixed into thousands of pounds of mixed material and then put on truckloads and trailer loads <laughs> where it's smelted. So the real risk to your average business very low. If a spaceship exploded and you can get data on it, that's much more valuable information than, than our customers are passing through us. Awesome. Well, that is a good point to stop. Now we've come to the point where I ask for your favorite quote. And I always start with my co-host. So that's you, Sean. What's your favorite quote and why? Well, so I'm going to take Bradley's quote of Bruce Snyder's quote, which is data is a toxic asset because as valuable as we think data is, it is also just as deadly. So it, it is the most double-sided sword I could think of right now. All right, good quote. All right, and I throw it to you, Frank. What's your favorite quote and why? So I really liked Aaron Bishop's quote. He had a lot to unpack there, but he refers to supply chains or all areas where these policies and procedures of the organization might be misconstrued or can't be met. And I take out the can't be met part because so many organizations will have policies and procedures in place that make it impossible for their users to actually perform the data disposition that they, that they need to take care of. So you don't want to handcuff your users in a way that makes it impossible for them 
do it. Therefore, they skirt around and do it in another way that's even worse than you intended. Which, by the way, you might as well define that's how security gets breached within an organization just like that. All right. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you, Sean. I want to thank your company, Frank, IT Asset Management Group, for sponsoring this very episode. This was a great conversation that was sorely needed, and we waited way too long to have it. So thank you very much. I let you have the last word. But Sean, any last comments from you? I will want to thank Frank as well. It's always good to hear someone thinking about the things that are not thought about. This is, again, apropos of everything we talk about in security is thinking before we do things. And in this case, thinking about destruction before we create the data. So a great topic to have. And Frank, please make a plug for IT Asset Management Group. Uh, Frank Milia, who's the partner with the company. What say you and any any sort of suggestions, advice, point people to? Yes. Yeah, so IT Asset Management Group, you know, has been providing disposition and data destruction services for over 20 years. And what we've seen throughout that time is that companies really struggle with their internal requirements, their procedures, their policies, their training, their documentation. So we've written a policy guide. It's basically a template that you can copy and paste out of, put your procedures into it, hopefully learn something from it. That can be downloaded at itamg.com forward slash CISO. And also I'm very active on LinkedIn. I'm happy to help people that are interested in having these sorts of conversations that we had here today. So Frank Milia, M-I-L-I-A, reach out on LinkedIn. Be happy to have a conversation. We will link to you on the post on CISOseries.com as well. Thank you, everybody, for your contributions, as I always say, and thank you for listening to Defense In Depth. We've reached the end of Defense In Depth. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss yet another hot topic in cybersecurity. This show thrives on your contributions. Please write a review, leave a comment on LinkedIn, or on our site, CISOseries.com, where you'll also see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at david at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to Defense In Depth. <laughs>